welcome the co-founder and CEO of Sonder, Francis Davidson, in conversation with Skift Senior Travel Tech Editor, Sean O'Neill. Hello, Francis. It's a privilege to see you again. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. Um, we last met in December 2019 and uh, was live in person in New York at our first uh, Skift event. And we had three of Saunders' direct competitors there as well represented, and they have all folded since then. Uh, so Sonder is now on a power play, to use a hockey metaphor. And as Aisha was just saying, you're planning to go public in the second half of this year via a SPAC, a special purpose acquisition company. So why go, why go the SPAC route instead of a traditional IPO? Yeah, well, listen, I think uh, the, the, the ambition of the company is always to transition to the public market. So um, we uh, have been studying you know, the various paths to make, to make that happen. And, uh, you know, a lot have been written about the advantages, the pros and cons, but, uh, you know, the majority of IPO dollars raised in 2021 so far are actually in the SPAC category. And uh, we, uh, we, we thought that, you know, it was really a great way for us to, to equip the balance sheet with the capital that we need to really kind of lean into the recovery. It's obviously been a very difficult 12, 14, now 15 months right in the industry. Um, but uh, we feel really optimistic that the next few years are one of are potentially one of the best opportunities to really lean in with a disruptive model. And so we want to make sure that that we have the capital to to, to take advantage of, of the recovery. Cool. I imagine a SPAC lets you sort of tell your story in your own way and also control sort of the pricing that you you get to start. What would be your pro forma enterprise value when if everything goes according to plan? That's right. So uh, you know we announced that the enterprise value would be at 2.2 billion and uh, we'd have you know upwards of 700 million dollars of, of, of cash on the balance sheet uh, when the transaction closes in the second half of this year cool um so the urban market saunders a very urban brand we heard earlier from my colleagues uh wilder gertz of uh, skiff research that last year urban sort of under indexed vacation rentals in terms of performance what is saunders seeing and your forecast for this year in terms of uh, growth in the urban markets yeah, I mean, we're, we're long-term optimistic that, that the demand is going to come back. And one of the key questions in the industry is the speed at which this is going to happen. And frankly, we think there's a lot of people that are really smart about the about the topic, you know, whether that's the Smith Travel Research or CBRE or other sources. And we kind of constantly refresh our views by looking at all of their perspectives. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, you know, some folks are saying 2023 or 2024, some markets even 2025 for a full rep car recovery. Um, I think one of the key questions is going to be uh, the speed at which business travel comes back and, you know, what business travel is going to look like. We certainly believe that it's going to be a little bit different, if not very different than what it was pre-pandemic. Uh, I think there's a broad consensus, though, around leisure travel coming back roaring. And I think a lot of companies are seeing that on their books right now for, you know, bookings coming in for the summer. And um, I think just anecdotally, people can't wait to visit cities. Um, and, uh, you know, after a year plus of, of, of traveling to, you know, more vacation destinations, I think cities are are going to see a, a really a really solid uh, you know upswing of demand in, in, in the coming months. Uh, so we're uh, you know at Saunders quite optimistic about the the pace of recovery, specifically relatively to uh, our comparable properties. So, uh, for example, occupancy rates at Saunders have bounced back to about seventy five percent as of summer of twenty twenty, and have hovered around pre pandemic levels just a few months uh, after the onset of the of the pandemic. I think we've been very lucky um, that you know we we have a small nimble team that was ready to jump in the action and uh, basically identify pockets of demand that would be really uh, great for for uh, for our, our kind of product, which is, um, you know, kind of extended stay or travel nurses and a variety of kind of use cases that we basically identified uh, that, you know, even though the leisure short term transient demand was very small, uh, we'd have uh, folks that would be interested in staying in Saunders. So it's really enabled us to outperform pretty drastically. Occupancies and rev cars have been nearly three times stronger uh, than our comps throughout. So. Uh, when it comes to kind of the speed of recovery, we're starting from a much different base. But even then, obviously, uh, as as short term leisure is coming back, you know, we're seeing our fair share of that coming coming to Saunders as well. So, so Sonder in your pitch decks have has said you've, you're a leisure brand heavy in terms of your customers, and you see leisure coming back first. So that's going to help uh, be a, a tailwind for Sonder in the short term. Do Do you feel like eventually you're going to get to sort of like a, like a half half leisure business mix over several years, or? Yeah, no. That, yeah, thank you for um, for the thoughtful question. So, the uh, we're eighty percent leisure um, pre pandemic, and we're also uh, young and domestic. And so, three uh, you know uh, sectors that we think are, are likely to bounce back a little bit faster than the broader industry. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, business is a big opportunity for us. Um, you know, we always speak about 
the innovation that we brought to the category in terms of the quality of the guest experience, the modernization of the service, uh, our capacity to use technology to uh, deliver those services in a far more effective fashion. But one thing we're frankly behind the large uh, hospitality players is on distribution, specifically on business travel, even on group. And so we did a, a, a number of hires in the industry, bringing folks that uh, really understand how to uh, you know, attract business travelers and the kinds of guests that are gonna help us uh, improve our weekday rep cars in particular. And so, um, and as much as we think that business travelers, travel is gonna be very different and there's uncertainty at the speed at which it's gonna come back, uh, we think that uh, it's definitely a, a big opportunity for us and something that uh, we're leaning in pretty, pretty aggressively. Uh, there's there's a belief that you know one of the differences in business travel is going to be uh, the rise of this kind of leisure trip. I, I myself right now I'm in Seattle and visiting our team here, and uh, instead of you know spending 48 hours here, I'm spending five days here, staying in a saunder and basically working during the day and exploring in the evening, meeting meeting with the team, and I'm going to go to three or four other cities on a two week trip. And we think these kind of fewer but longer trips that are multi city, where we're basically traveling on the road during the day. Um, are going to be more frequent. And we think that, that positions us to have a really interesting value proposition for travel managers um, and, and frankly, the end kind of business traveler uh, that, that just benefits from, from the kind of offering that we have. That, that, that's very fascinating. Uh, and I, I guess I'd like to go back to the business model. Um, you're, you're one way that when we talked last in December 2019, uh, we, we talked with Sonder and with the other competitors about the risk management in terms of the lease contracts, uh, uh, sort of a capital intensive model. There was a lot of fixed term leases. And your latest pitch deck says that in the next three to five years, you want to move to majority liability light. So what's that and why is it significant? Yeah, no, I think it's a really key strategic question for our business. So we spent a lot of time analyzing and thinking through this for with people that are really um, you know, uh, industry out, you know, insiders as well that give us kind of a perspective as to how hospitality companies evolved over time. And, um, you know, our view is that in the long run, uh, a liability like business is, is really powerful, but we ought not to jump the gun and be very careful uh, to uh, do uh, transition our business model like as we reach certain kinds of proof points. And so, for example, uh, you know, we started, when I started the business in college, I was literally renting student apartments uh, and, and we started working with landlords and, and signing you know, a handful of units in, in, in a new building. And now almost exclusively, Saunder adds entire buildings, entire developments, properties are being built for our own specific use. And um, things that we introduced maybe two or three years ago were downside protection clauses. So leases, but leases where the rents go down in case of recession, um, asymmetric lease duration. So we sign a relatively short term initial term, and then we have renewal options at our election. And so a lot of innovation that we bring to the table every year. Uh, the latest one in the last 18 months has been a, a movement towards a capital light model. So Sonder does not put capital in, um, in these prop properties to elevate them to our brand standards. So in 90% of cases, roughly landlords, our owners are funding uh, the ff &E and CapEx investments so that we our, our brand standards are met. And now about 20% plus of our pipeline is uh, liability light revenue share. Um, and you would think that's not, not going to be the last evolution of the business. We think that franchise contracts and eventually also software revenue is likely to be an important part of our, of our business model to kind of monetize all the IP that we're developing to you know, run these properties. The operating system for hospitality, we believe, is going to be a really interesting suite of software to offer to even other brands. Um, so you know, we're constantly looking at evolving our business model. And in this at steady state, we're probably looking at some properties that we operate ourselves under leases, some that are under revenue shares, some that are front new franchise contracts. Uh, and then software revenue, kind of like we think that mixture uh, brings, uh, you know, is, is probably the, kind of the best end state for the business. Uh, that's fascinating that, uh, you know, moving to more capital light, I hear uh, possible franchises, uh, software as a service for some of your tech. Uh, it's a very interesting. Um, one thing I, on LinkedIn, you said earlier this spring that uh, about half of your new signings of property were from uh, apartment developments, either partial or whole buildings typically. And then another half of your signings now are hotels, buildings that were built as hotels and that you refurbish, modernize, bring to a Sonder brand standard. That seems to be a shift from like when we last talked a couple of years ago, like shifting more towards a, a sort of hotel inventory. Why, why do that? Yeah, no, thank you again for the, for the thoughtful question. The, um, I think, I think the first, the first, there's multiple reasons, but the first one is just looking at the, the guests and, um, our guests sometimes wants a two bedroom apartment when they're traveling with their family. Otherwise for a 48 hour business trip, a 350 square foot hotel room, that's really beautifully designed where they can have access to all the Sonder services on their phone through the Sonder app, uh, is a really fine experience and they don't need the extra space. And so our view is, you know, we want to become uh, one of the largest and most loved hospitality brands, if not the largest. 
And for that to be the case, like we need to have an offering that maps to the various use cases of, of the modern traveler. Um, and so I think that's probably the biggest reason. There's also other reasons in terms of our uh, supply opportunities. You know, from a real estate perspective, we realize that actually uh, hotel conversions can deliver tremendous amounts of value, both for owners and for us. Uh, our capacity to really kind of up-level the design and the quality of the experience and at the same time, uh, reduce the operating costs. So both an improvement in customer satisfaction scores and an improvement in, in bottom line performance for the property um, is a massive opportunity. Uh, and we actually believe that a lot of these assets, there's a finite quantity of these assets and there's quite a lot of urgency to go and identify the best independent properties that are in the best locations. Uh, so we thought that you know the time was, uh, was now to really lean into it. Uh, we've been exploring with the hotel model We've been exploring the hotel mall, I believe, since since about 20, 2018. And, and we just have been seeing the results from these from these assets, uh, both in terms of customer experience and in terms of uh, financial viability, and been really, really excited about the category. And we thought that especially cool. in a moment where hotels were struggling, it was a really great moment for us to for, for us to step in. That's cool. We we did a poll of our audience attendees here about what it, what factors they believe are driving Saunders growth. Um, you know, some said it was design. Some said it was tech. Some said it was the desirability of your locations. And some, uh, be, you know, a, a large group believe that you know, you're being able to have the advantage of venture capital funding. I know when you and your CFO have talked with us in the past, tech has been one of the big uh, differentiators for you. But I want to build on the answer that you just had there, like. Uh, one of the early advantages that uh, Saunders sort of had was because you had a lot of your uh, properties were licensed regulatorily as short-term rentals. And so you could position uh, properties in neighborhoods that maybe hotels uh, wouldn't be regulatorily able to compete as licensed brands. But as you shift your inventory more over to hotel inventory, it would seem like you're competing more directly with the traditional hotel brands that have a head start in picking the best locations with a lot of skill and real estate analysis. Um, and I, you know, when I see Boston, I looked this morning, it seemed like you only had about three properties in the greater Boston area. And Boston had introduced a lot of uh, restrictions with short-term rentals a while ago. So is, is this a headwind for your growth to scale? Yeah, well, um, just a quick comment on the survey, by the way. I think everyone's right. <laughs> all these things contribute <laughs> to our success, so thank you. You've all gotten the right answer. Um, you know, uh, I think on, on location, um, let's see. We've, uh, so we, we have about a 50-50 split, as I mentioned, but the hotels that we have are quite different than the hotels that you'll find in the big box chain. We're talking about typically sub-125 key independent hotels, and a lot of them are located in neighborhoods that are actually really interesting. Maybe they haven't seen an uplift or facelift in a while. And so that's why we work with owners to come up with a property improvement plan that's going to tick the box from a brand perspective for us. Um, but there's a lot of really cool, interesting uh, hotels. So, for example, we've signed a hotel in Cambridge recently in a really interesting location where there aren't, you know, large, you know, high rise uh, hotels. And uh, we think that uh, there's quite a lot. It's kind of surprising to see the extent to which there are some of these subscale hotels. Uh, in the United States and internationally, especially internationally, if you look at a market like Amsterdam or Barcelona or Madrid, like places that we've either launched or are launching very shortly, have a tremendous amount of these independent properties that are in actually the absolute best locations. Uh, if you look at Rome or Milan or, you know, uh, the European, Western European capitals in particular are super attractive. If you look at the French Quarter in New Orleans, a lot of independent hotels there, a lot of which uh, are kind of converting into, into Sonder properties. So, um, I think cool. over the last uh, so we do we do have one audience yeah. question. One audience oh, question. Sure. I want to get to it because we only have a minute left. So what what's the biggest Absolutely. challenge or risk did you see in hitting some of those supply targets that you mentioned? Yeah, well, listen. I mean, I think I think the supply targets that we put on the board are are, are very are more than achievable. Like for example, in Q4 of 2019, we signed upwards of a thousand units a month, and what we put on the board for the next 18 months is is sub 1,000 per month. So it's the pace of supply signings that we've already that we've already seen. But you know, listen, the old, the challenges are. The quality of the real estate has to become better and better. We ask for better and better terms every year. And of course, we have to meet all the regulations, the compliance. So that kind of filters out some of the opportunity set. But again, we've already identified much more than, than what's needed to, to, to generate our, our growth targets. I feel re really optimistic. Thank you, Francis. Yeah, and just for our attendees, let you know that LT, uh, one of the, Lawrence Tosi, one of the investors in Sonder, will be speaking at a later session today, along with uh, what his colleague, who has uh, sort of helped a lot of design issues that have also helped with Sonder. So you'll want to tune into that. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Francis, for joining us today. We're grateful. Appreciate it. Thanks so much, Sean.